When we first started, we couldn't find any group in Canada specifically dedicated to fighting the death penalty. We felt that was important to have a Canadian voice. We are hopeful that the United States will wake up and join the rest of the world. On the internet and off, they're known as the Canadian Coalition Against the Death Penalty. The world is watching Texas, the world is watching the USA, and it's not liking what it sees. They're basically a coalition of two. Dave Parkinson, who has a clerical job in a Toronto law office, and his wife Tracy Lamory, who's in sales, and a new mother. Since 1998, in their basement in Scarborough, Ontario, they've mounted a grassroots campaign against the death penalty. With small donations of money, even stamps, their one-time hobby has become a near obsession to convince others, especially Americans, to follow Canada's example and abolish capital punishment. Throughout history, there have been people who've meddled in the affairs of countries who are having human rights abuses or repressing people. It's our right and our responsibility to ensure that the citizens, not only in the United States, but around the world, see the faces and cases of these individuals that are going to be put to death by their government. But they had no way of knowing their mom-and-pop operation would soon hurl them into a pitched battle with the American legal system, specifically the state of Arizona. It was a fight inspired, at least in part, by what happened here in Arizona to a man named Ray Crone. He was a letter carrier who'd never been in trouble with the law, that is, until he was arrested for murder, tried, convicted, and sent to Arizona's death row. His nightmare began the night Kim Akona, a bartender at Ray Crone's favorite tavern, closed up alone. She was discovered dead the next morning. The police found Crone's phone number in her address book, and he went from passing acquaintance to prime suspect. As I was getting out of my car, I heard screeching brakes and doors opening. I heard people yelling, and I looked, and there's a van load of police officers, all armed, told me to freeze, get down on the ground. They slammed me, to, you know, handcuffed me, took me off, and that's when they told me I was arrested for murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. Even so, Crone says he didn't get really worried until he spoke with his court-appointed attorney. Their actual words to me were, You've been charged with murder, kidnapping, sexual assault. You can expect to be found guilty, but we'll fight it on appeal. You know, and that's when something started dawning on me. And that's when the, the pit of your stomach started rolling around and you wonder, well, what am I going to do? Why don't they believe me? Ray Crone was indeed convicted of murder, then sentenced to death. Later, Alan Simpson became his lawyer. What really was the linchpin of the state's case and what got him indicted and I think resulted in his conviction was that Ray had a very unusual teeth pattern and our victim had had a bite mark on her breast, a very distinct bite mark. Though a recent study has shown that odontology, the science of bite marks, is wrong almost two-thirds of the time, an expert witness apparently convinced the jury Crone was the killer. The razzle-dazzle that was performed by the state prosecutors showed the raised dental casts and the victim's breast bite marks and then overlaid them and really gave texture, gave feeling to this odontologist's opinion. So Ray Crone found himself in the middle of the Arizona desert on death row. Everywhere you went was some kind of big heavy mail door, either slamming shut or opening up. You're not sure your knees are going to hold you up. And no matter what you do, you still can hardly keep motivating yourself forward. They actually got to kind of carry you because you're in such total shock. Crone says life on the row was so bad, his death sentence began to look good. Death would have been a release. Even if it means Even if it means execution. death. Most everybody in there had already made, accepted the fact that, that, that you know, being executed is, is my last act on this world and wherever, whatever happens after that has got to be better than living here on death row. The knowledge at the end of it you intend to be put to death was actually uh, in a way a comfort. Back then he had no idea he had a distant relative in the computer business named Jim Ricks and Ricks had never heard of his cousin Ray. That was about to change. I got a phone call from my mom, and she just off the cuff mentioned, you know, you have a cousin on death row who's innocent. Well, I'm thinking, right, you know, he's innocent. You know, I, in fact, I, I contacted him just out of curiosity. I want to know what he did, you know, the details of the murder. Well, what about this black sheep in my family? 
The owner of a California software company, Jim Ricks was curious enough to visit Crone. Eventually, he became convinced his cousin was an innocent man, but to prove it would take nine years, $200,000, and a website. We started collecting the forensic reports, made that all available on the web. I used that as a vehicle just to inform the people that were interested in the case what was going on. Despite mounting interest in Crone's case, they desperately needed something dramatic to overturn his conviction. At trial, DNA tests had been inconclusive. Years later, with technology vastly improved, his legal team had the evidence tested again. This time, it not only excluded Ray Crone, it produced a precise DNA match to someone else. The hit was to a guy named Ken Phillips. Mr. Phillips lived in an apartment complex a mere couple hundred yards from our murder scene. In fact, was on probation when Ms. Acona was murdered. He was on probation for a sex offense. And in fact, when we developed a hit on Mr. Phillips, he was in the Arizona Department of Corrections serving a prison sentence for a child molestation that occurred some three weeks after the murder of Kim Acona. He was our man. However, Arizona prosecutors were unmoved. So Alan Simpson found Ken Phillips in prison and persuaded him to talk. Hey, what's the first thing you look at before you see blood? See, the first thing I put was my hand. Blood on your hands. What happened? And he just said, you know, you know, I'm cleaning you know. up. I told him that he was special. And then, you know, she mumbled with something. I can hear I got up, got upset because I just got to go. But even when the man who was a DNA match placed himself at the crime scene with blood on his hands, it still wasn't enough to get Ray Crone released. One would think as soon as they have the DNA evidence that they would simply let Ray out, but they weren't doing that. On www.3raycrone.com, Jim Ricks posted and promoted Ken Phillips' confession, doing all he could to publicly ratchet up the pressure on Arizona prosecutors. None of the evidence fit Ray Crone. They had DNA, they had fingerprints, they had uh, footprints. Uh, I witnessed testimony, nobody saw him there. I mean, it was so, oh, he was so overwhelmingly innocent that uh, I just wanted people to know that. And finally, it worked. After convictions in two trials and ten years in prison, three of them on death row, his conviction was overturned and Ray Crone was free at last. Even so, Gary Phelps of the Arizona Department of Corrections refuses to admit the state came close to executing an innocent man. As the man who's charged with administering the death penalty in Arizona, does the case of Ray Crone give you pause? No, I uh, have ever confidence in our legal system, and like I said, that's a, that's one where the case worked. The Arizona Department of Corrections characterizes you as an example of the system working. Do you see it that way? <laughs> Justice was not done by them. They fought it the whole way. It was only because of the perseverance of my family, their dedication, their money, that that got me out. When Ray Crone walked out of prison in Arizona, he was the hundredth inmate in the U.S. to be found not guilty of the crime for which he'd been sentenced to death. The real issue, of course, is how many of the wrongly convicted have been executed before they could be proven innocent. It's a question heard in one place more than any other. If there's been a flashpoint in the controversy over capital punishment in the U.S., it's been in the state of Illinois. But much of the ammunition for closer scrutiny of the death penalty hasn't come from Illinois' court system or its state legislature. But from right here, outside Chicago, on the campus of Northwestern University, it began 12 years ago when one Northwestern professor had an ambitious assignment for some of his students. Next week at 4 o'clock in Fisk 111... That professor is David Protus of Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, who thought he was giving his students an impossible task exonerate inmates on Illinois death row. Originally I was skeptical that my college kids would find anything. I just thought it would be a good educational <laughs> exercise. And then lo and behold, they played a decisive role in freeing four innocent men, two from death row. 
and it was just the beginning. To date, Protus and his students have been responsible for the release of eight people wrongly convicted of murder, four of them sentenced to death. On the one hand, what my students have done is a very inspiring story. On the other hand, uh, I have a great deal of, uh, of, of, of dismay uh, when I really think about the implications of a group of 21-year-old college students in a class project being the last line of defense against an innocent person being put to death. That's enough to make one pretty cynical. One of those freed by the college kids was Aaron Patterson, released following almost 17 years on death row after a murder confession tortured out of him by police. Y'all know how hard it was for me to get my case out there. It's very important that y'all look into other guys' cases on death row and in prison population. There are more innocent people locked up. Patterson credits those two Canadians working from their basement in Scarborough with keeping his case alive by posting his arguments of innocence on their website when few others seem to listen. Someone like Aaron Patterson sitting on death row for 15, 16, 17, 18 years, you know, he wants to get out, he wants his case looked at. So Lamory and Parkinson's mission is to use the internet to right the wrongs of capital punishment. And like Ray Crone in Arizona, Aaron Patterson is one of their shining examples. His page is one of the more extensive pages that we had uh, with numerous documents on there, legal documents, uh, photographs, information, uh, basically backing up his claims of innocence. The courts did not respond to Aaron Patterson's pleadings that he was innocent. And so having websites about the Aaron Patterson case and having thousands of letters that resulted from the postings on those websites come to the governor uh, exerted the kind of pressure that led him to make a decision to free an innocent man. Stateville Correctional Center is the home of Illinois' execution chamber and a year ago the destination for a march by exonerated death row inmates from across the U.S. They descended on Stateville, demanding extreme measures to ensure that never again would someone wrongly convicted be put to death. Incredibly, that's what they got. <laughs> Illinois Governor George Ryan, a former supporter of capital punishment, ordered his state's death row to be emptied, immediately pardoning four inmates and commuting the sentences of 156 more to life in prison. And because the Illinois death penalty system is arbitrary and capricious and therefore immoral, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. Opponents of capital punishment argue there's no reason to believe that the machinery of death works any better in the other 37 death penalty states than it does in Illinois. Groups like the Canadian Coalition Against the Death Penalty say that's precisely why they provide inmate internet access, so that those who want to proclaim their innocence can do so. But there's another side to this story, because almost everyone agrees that for the dozens, even hundreds of people awaiting execution in the U.S. with a legitimate basis to protest their convictions, there are thousands more who did indeed commit the murders for which they've been convicted. And now, thanks to the folks from Scarborough, Ontario, they can get their messages to the outside world, too. The Canadian Coalition's website not only carries legal information, but it also displays personal photographs, artwork, requests for pen pals, even financial support. This website is posted for a man named Charles Ng. You may recall he was arrested in Calgary for more than a dozen murders in California. Online, from San Quentin's death row, he describes himself as a victim. Ng says he's sad and lonely, like a dolphin caught inside a tuna net, seeking sincere friendship. Parkinson and Lamry will post material from anyone on death row, even those guilty of some of the most infamous crimes in U.S. history. Is there no one who has done something so heinous that perhaps that's all we really need to know about that person? We may not like what the individual has done, we may be completely appalled by what the individual has done. But again, people have to realize he's still a, or she is still an individual, and still a human being. As you'll see when we come back, their online campaign against the death penalty has made the two Canadians from Scarborough infamous as well, especially for the families of some of those who've been brutally murdered.